Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me this morning. Thank you very much for being here today. Um, I'm Bill Ellen, the director here at ISU. Uh, I want to open by thanking CD and Jeff for undertaking this event, for gathering people together in a celebration of and a mutual coaching of uh, athletics and emphasizing what's most important in athletics, certainly what many of us believe as educators, which is athletics as an inclusive enterprise. And what does it mean when you're doing it for everybody? And it's got to take on a very different place from what some of the high stakes sort of coaching might in different places and in different uh, organizations. Um, so uh, Jeff asked me to come in today and speak a little bit about child protection. And at first I was a little hesitant because I'm not an expert in it. It's of course something that is my ward and our collective ward as educators. And it's something important to talk about. But I wasn't sure that I could shed unique light on it in the, in the context of athletics, particularly when I myself am not a coach. Um, so it prompted me to learn quite a bit and try to get a little bit more information on what exactly child protection in the context of children's athletics could look like. And so I discovered some interesting things that I'll share with you today. Uh, for some of you, you will already come from contexts that have robust child protection programs. I apologize if some of this is obvious or familiar to you, but I think it's important to go over and important to go over together so that what we have is a shared understanding. Because at the end of the day, one of the reasons I felt increasingly comfortable to come and speak today was that it's not about one person being an expert because child protection isn't about one person. And the same way that athletics is not, uh, nor is the possibility of having an association of schools about one school. And so it is a shared responsibility that we have. It's a shared responsibility that UBAC has. And part of what I want to do today, to use the words of Doug Kilgore, is to afflict the comfortable by telling you a little bit, just enough for you to realize what the shared responsibility of UBAC schools is going forward to make sure that children have a safe environment in which to develop their character and their skills. Okay, so uh, that's ultimately what my objective is here. Uh, and as I said, I'm riffing on themes that some of you will already be familiar with. So I decided I'd open with this slide because at first, my next slide says uh, child protection risk factors. And then I started to think, you know, the big problem is they're risk factors for us. I hope I say that totally inclusively, but they're opportunities for a predator. And so it's really important to recognize that what we're doing when we try to protect children is we're trying to think of all of the ways in which we've left doors open that with a little forethought, we could have closed. There's things that we can't do and can't possibly foresee, because indeed it is true that education of children brings out people with a sexual interest in children. And our purpose here is not to come up with a magic way that we can actually determine who those people are when they're in our midst, but it is to make sure that we pay sensible attention to things in our environment that are in our control, that can make it increasingly difficult for somebody to harm children in our care, okay? So I want us to recognize as we go through this that everything that we're identifying as risks is precisely what somebody bent on harming a child would be viewing as an opportunity. And we're trying to make sure that we're one step ahead wherever possible to close off those opportunities. So I got to thinking about risk factors in athletics as distinct from school in general, which we deal with on a daily basis as educators. Uh, and realize that a couple of these were my ideas, many of them are already out there in the literature. There's well-established uh, organizations that deal with child protection uh, in the context of athletics. Um, but I put team loyalty among the very top uh, because there is a strong sense, not only team loyalty, loyalty to the coach. There's a very big difference between a coach and athlete relationship and a teacher-student relationship. Uh, and that sense of loyalty that sense of conflicted value is something that can be exploited in the hands of somebody bent on doing that. Okay, so it is one of the things that makes unique issues, that introduces a unique kind of risk in an athletic context. Another one is generally the close mentorship relationship between the coach and the athlete. However that plays itself out, some of you will know, and we'll talk perhaps briefly about it, that very often, Child abuse, child molestation, begins with a process of trust building, something they call grooming. 
Okay? Coach mentoring relationships are perfect for it. They are perfect for it because of their intensity, their proximity, because of the fact that they often, in terms of the character discussions that they engender, cross lines that might not be crossed in a classroom, in a teacher-student relationship. And because, as you will know, conversations, deeply personal conversations, already leave people more vulnerable. They build trust. They build a weakness that can be celebrated when there is no ill will, but can otherwise be exploited when there is. Physical proximity. Athletics are very physical activities, and they give people cause to be close together, both adult and child and children with each other. And abuse is not just adult. And so it's important to recognize the fact that you put people in proximity with each other increases, increases the access and the possibility of that sort of abuse. Extended exposure through the course of the gameplay, through the time afterwards, through trips that people take. There's all kinds of opportunities and intensities that you don't reproduce in the classroom. They just don't get that constant access. Traveling away from campus, it's unique, in some ways quite different than from the things that we'll have day to day, but the opportunities that that presents to a peer, to a teacher, to somebody from outside the organization entirely are very high. They're a whole new set of risk factors when you're taking kids on tournament trips. And finally, changing and washing. <coughs> There's more nudity in athletics than there is in our classrooms, I hope. Okay, the fact of the matter is that extra proximity element, and for most of us, the fact that we're dealing with pre-adolescence and adolescence, all of those things together are just an incredible mix. It's dynamite in terms of the possibilities that it introduces and the possibilities for abuse. And that's, I think, some of the elements that are unique in the athletic context, to kind of up the ante a little bit. So what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about varieties of abuse, signs you might have for them, signs that somebody might be abusing, and just giving us a general, set, a small set of tools. We're not going to walk out of this as experts, but hopefully we walk out, as I said, with just enough information that we are feeling a little afflicted. And that's a cause, then, to build something more robust and to keep one eye on child protection protocols and you back at all times. So, among others, there's physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. All of these can occur. They can occur between adult and child. They can occur between parent and child. They can occur between peers. And we want to look at all of them and recognize we're not looking at unique profiles for the possibility that these things occur. So possible signs of physical abuse. Some of them are very clear. Bruises, cuts, things like that. They're the obvious ones and the high profile instances. Students who choose to keep limbs covered when it's unnecessary, when it perhaps doesn't even make sense to do so, that can be a sign. Not always. The world's not so obliging that these things are guarantees, but they're things that you want to be putting together into a whole picture of the welfare of the children in your care. Withdrawal from physical contact. A real aversion to it. You know, you go up and pat a child on the back, and there is a visible flinching. Self-destructive tendencies. Insofar as you're in a coaching role, it's possible you're going, to see some, you're going to see things about a child's emotional state that won't be as obvious in a classroom as groups come and go. And that can be a surefire sign. Aggressive conduct towards others or, and or towards you. Something distinctly oppositionally defined in the way you reach out and the way they withdraw or contest that relationship. Lack of achievement or lack of concentration. Athletic or otherwise. Regressive or immature behavior. Passive or compliant conduct, the very opposite of being oppositional and defiant. A distrust of others or a refusal to talk about injuries. A simple conversation, holy cow, what you do with yourself, becomes odd because for some reason you just can't get a handle on what should otherwise have been a pretty straightforward conversation. possible signs of emotional abuse. And you will notice as you go through, there's no clear boundary between signs of abuse 
and the particular form of abuse that they might have, have come from, might have resulted from. There could be real changes in behavior or mood, especially when a child withdraws, becomes clingy, demonstrates anxiety, low self-esteem, depression, phobia, or obsession. Now, emotional abuse is often talked about in the context of a child's family life. But I think it's really important to recognize that a large part of what we classify as bullying is emotional abuse. It can be a threat of physical harm, but even that absence of touch means that this is precisely where its impact will be felt in the child's emotional well-being. And so talking about the dynamics, the social pecking order that goes on between children in the context of athletics, very often this is the highest likelihood of abuse that you're going to be confronting. Uh, children become either aggressive or passive. You know, somehow their responses are not measured to the stimuli that they're confronted with. A strong lack of trust, either between them and their peers, them and you. And oftentimes it can be directed at somebody who's not necessarily the cause, but it still reveals a symptom that's worthy of investigation. Difficulty maintaining healthy relationships with their peers, either a subset of them, which could be very revealing, or all of them in general, that there's simply this inability to connect in normal and healthy ways developmentally. The onset of attention-seeking behavior, persistent fatigue, as if somebody's unable to sleep, uh, inappropriate emotional responses to painful situations, either undue pleasure or undue harm, Indeed, I thought this one was rather funny because I think the footballers rolling around on the field when they've barely been touched. Now, that's not necessarily emotional abuse, but it's, it's a good demonstration of what it might look like. And lacks of achievement. You know, somebody who's suddenly not engaging in ways where you would have thought this was a source of pleasure and interest for them before. Sexual abuse. Again, you'll discover there's a high overlap with the emotional overtones, the fact that there's physical contact, etc. Age-appropriate sexualized behavior. It's one thing to know that adolescents are interested in sex. Does it manifest itself in a way that seems unhealthy? Either unduly consuming their time, unduly aggressive or violent, or there's something unnatural about the way it expresses itself, unhealthy and unsavory. Those would be signs. Sexually provocative behavior with peers, usually, but not necessarily at all. You need to know, you know, is this, is this what you could reasonably expect from them and their peer group? Or is it something that seems to step outside of statistical norms? Extremes of passivity or aggression, again. Fear of people or places, including stranger anxiety, or fear of a particular person. That one could be extremely obvious, but it's often worth noting how a child is socially engaged with their peers, with other people in their environment, and given your proximity with them as coaches, I presume you'll have a good degree of opportunity to do that, to make those observations and make those measurements. Are the relationships healthy? Is there anything where you say, hey, what's going on there? Are you guys in conflict? Or is this, you know, exploring it to see? Refusal to continue school or social activities. I mean, that one's a pretty dramatic and obvious one. Something worth investigating is a child who's no longer connecting with the activities that they used to connect with. Persistent fatigue, again, somebody who's unable to sleep, that doesn't have a piece of mind to sleep. <clears throat> Stomach pain, discomfort walking or sitting, difficulty urinating or pain in the genitals. If, some, if a child talked about it and felt comfortable enough doing so, that itself could reveal to you cues or clues. Vaginal or penile discharge or blood. You'll know with the kids what their cycles are, particularly with female athletes, with male athletes, whether everything's okay, and being able to check in and say, how are you doing? How's your body? How's your sense of well-being? You know, Those are things that I think it's extremely important to determine that nothing is amiss with a child physically. And of course, an obvious one that's less likely to be a symptom for us, but STDs, which are very unlikely in children of 12 to 15 years old. What about signs of abusers? Now again, the problem is it would be really nice if they just had a scarlet A on their chest, and they don't. So we've still got to be determining whether or not things look kosher, whether something strikes us as odd or uncomfortable. One of the things that we do annually in talking about child protection here at the school 
is we talk about the fact that our purpose here is not to create a sort of McCarthyistic theory where nobody trusts each other. Much the contrary, our purpose is to create shared standards that we can talk about openly with each other and say, oh look, you know, I saw you talking with that student and the door was closed, you may want to, next time you may want to, blah, blah. With the understanding that nobody wants their professionalism to be impugned, nobody wants their reputation harmed, and that we're here to buoy each other up and help each other. And indeed, the only beneficiaries of a culture of goodwill like that are going to be us and our children. And that's precisely the point. And so it's child protection is a culture question. And it's about the kind of culture that we're building and whether or not we can get comfortable as coaches and educators talking with each other about things like this. When we see conduct that we think is questionable, calling people on it in a way that is without accusation, but recognizes that we're always watching. So, students, as peer offenders, may have an unusual interest in sex, unsurprisingly. They may not stop sexual behaviors or sexual commentary when they're asked to do so. They may use force or coercion in social situations, which may reveal how they would act in other situations. And there may be an unusual intensity or predilection when they're talking about sex and sexuality. Those are things that can obviously be signs in peers. Of course, exactly that in an adult would be even more alarming and worth flagging. But there are other signs there in the context of adults. Identification of a favorite student or child. An attempt to find ways to be alone with children. It's not the being alone. It's the frequency and the unusual tendency to have too much private to talk about. Why should it be that you and you alone have this unique need and nobody else does and they're still able to fulfill their duties and they're still able to meet a child's needs? Inappropriate language, jokes, or discussion about children or in their proximity. If you have good reason to question somebody's judgment, that can bleed out in all kinds of ways. And of course, we want to know that we're working with people of good judgment and good character. So those are the sorts of things that may be flags for us. As I said, what it should mean is that we have a collective and shared responsibility to communicate our concern. Uh, maybe, you know, why don't you have those conversations out in the lobby or something like that? Or, or if you sense that there's any graver concern, to report it. Uh, or to look for patterns because any of these can be a flag. Uh, question. Yes. <clears throat> In regards to adults and developing that culture that there has to be some trust um, uh, along with the professionalism. Yes, absolutely. Now, scenario. You have two individuals one could be a teacher coach, the other strictly academic teacher. But the trust has been broken. Mm. The professional trust between them? And trust one human being to another. Yes. Now you have one of the two parties, they report a fallacy on someone, an allegation mm -hmm. against someone else. From an administrator perspective, now I know I always get both sides of the story. But if you have that background knowledge that, okay, there are some issues between these two already. Yes. How do you, how do you categorize the allegation as an administrator, particularly when it comes to child protection? Yeah, uh, no, that's a very good question. I think it's somewhat, there's lots of factors. There's the severity of the allegation. Sure. There's possible evidence. If there's a yes. third party involved, it's not just the words of two. Right. Now you're trying to triangulate and gather that evidence where you can. Okay. Um, I think, uh, like I said, depending on the severity, for me, it might be a flag. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's something that I carry in my awareness and see whether independent evidence comes up. Mm -hmm. I'm very aware when there's people who are in professional conflicts mm -hmm. and it always seems to be the two that go back and forth, um, that you, you definitely take it with a grain of salt. Uh, because, you know, but at the same time, as I said, I would want to flag for patterns, uh, and if it was severe enough, I, it's not something I would drop easily. I think I'd need to know more about the character of it to let you know whether I could simply leave it be, or whether it's the kind of thing that I would have to put in restrictions and restraints to make sure that it could not occur again while I looked into it in greater detail. But it would play a role if you know that somebody, that people are engaged in professional conflict, for sure. And that includes students. You know, of course, students even more strongly as they're learning those mature relationships, they could be ratting each other out all the time. Yeah. And in my experience, yes, yeah, yeah. And it, it very much can be. And it really, at the end of the day, can boil down to a deeply personal one. But yeah, uh, and those are really difficult to remediate, particularly with adults. I don't know if you would involve a counselor. Once you know, okay, this is just one after another. Yeah. There's no evidence to support the allegation. Yeah. So would you involve a counselor or? Uh, I guess it would depend on the character, but my first inclination, let's remove the child protection for just a moment. Uh, presuming it's an interpersonal conflict, the first thing that I'd want to do is call on people's sense of professionalism and duty. To resolve the matter and simply say, you know, you're the kind of the editorial voice that accompanies your need to work together is irrelevant. And professional adults should recognize that and silence or not use that voice in terms of their relationships with other people. If it really was an irreconcilable conflict, absolutely. I bring in resources that know more than I do, somebody who could deal with interpersonal conflict. Uh, and I, you're right, I think the really difficult one, and in some ways it can transcend the abilities of a counselor, are broken trust. Uh, but at the very least, what you have to do is go to the root of what that is, what that cause is, because it will show itself in 50 different ways, and never honestly, you know, it becomes smaller complex. Yeah, no, that's a very good question, and there is no easy answer. Uh, but to be sure, I think uh, it depends on your measure of risk in the community. And if I thought the risk was high, I'd certainly be taking it more seriously. Um, and the reputations of the two people involved in that conflict mm -hmm. and the risks to them would be equally high right. as a consequence. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you bet. Um, okay, so possible signs of emotional abusers or bullies, discriminatory behavior, ostracizing someone on or off the field of play. They play together, but then they don't engage socially outside. That could be a message, and it could be something, the threat of which is very real, when they're back on the field together. That inability to connect outside of the field of play. Intimidating another player verbally, or through gesture and stance. We're not talking about, perhaps, obviously, this admits of degree. There's places and times where you want to assert your authority in the arena. But there are places and ways that are just an appropriate period that are clearly designed to intimidate, not athletically, but morally, okay? And really, you, you become the experts on that. You're the ones as the coaches who work with the kids who are building that, the, both the esprit de corps and the expectations for sportsmanship. You're the ones who can say, don't you think that was a little much? That came out a little hard? Or what is your purpose? Evaluate what you're trying to accomplish through your conduct. Disparaging other athletes on the basis of skills, appearance, etc or disregard of basic emotional needs. And we'll come back to this one in the context of neglect, because a coach that rides a kid hard to the point of injury is guilty of abuse. Okay? Somebody who says, no, get water later, get out there. That's abuse. Okay? We're responsible for the welfare of children. We're responsible for their health and their well-being. So I put those two together because I think that they can be very closely related to each other. So, refusal to remove a player in distress after injury or something like that. Training at the expense of their basic needs. When they express a need to go to the toilet, they need water or something like that. What are you driving them for? I mean, we know as educators that we want them to be in the finest form to tackle the challenges ahead. And that should show itself in athletics and in education. And disregard of basic emotional needs. Somebody who expresses fear, aggravation, frustration, and you know, 
brush it off, walk it off, man up, whatever. I mean, there are times where perhaps that's appropriate. There are a large number of times where it's not, where you really want to make sure somebody's okay. You want to recognize the character of their emotional distress, and you want to help them to cope with it, first in the short run, and then to build the kind of tools they need in the long run to deal with it, so that it doesn't become something more debilitating. Okay, so that sort of sets a picture of what the child protection risks might be. We explored those a bit. So what does it mean for you back? Sorry, this list is not even as long as it could be. Um, but it's just a few ideas about the kinds of things that we should already have or should be thinking of having as we move forward as an association of like-minded educators. What our kids need and have a right to. There should be codes of conduct for athletes and for chaperones explicitly including child protection measures. What kinds of things are flaggable and what are not? What do we expect from these people? Create a UBAC statement of child safeguarding to guide practice. Just indeed as there was a discussion by Doug Kilgore about a mission statement that captures what you believe at its essence about athletics and development, there should be something similar. What do we think about child safety and how, how do we work to ensure it as a team, as a, as a group? Provide clear methods for disclosure of abuse in UBAC. Because it should be out in the open. When it cannot be talked about, it will not be discovered. Do not leave students in your care unattended. It's a simple one. Right? Making sure in your chaperoning role that you've always got a sense of where they are. You know how long that rope can be as educators, but making sure that it's that long and no longer. Do not leave students in your care attended by only one peer or one adult. Provide clear spaces on the campus where things should be happening and shouldn't be happening, and guidelines to visitors to campus. This is off limits, guys. No reason for you to be in the stairwell that goes to the garage or whatever. These places you can be, etc. Provide host supervision in those spaces. When you're hosting the tournament, you're the ones who know the lay of the land. The expectation is you take first responsibility for the welfare of your guests. That's your duty when you're having them in your building and your facility. But it doesn't mean that visitors have no responsibility. They're there with children in their own care, and they accept total responsibility for the guidelines and the systems shared with them by their hosts. How are we going to work together in this tournament to make sure that we can fulfill our duties of care with the kids? Uh, providing chaperoning supervision of the students, in that respect. Vetting your chaperones in appropriate ways. This one is crucial, and it is a pain in the ass. And it sets a standard for every school that we want to play together with. And if you don't want to play this way, you don't belong in UVAC. And that means accepting that there's a shared responsibility to vet the quality of the educators that are working with our children. That we can't all be working really hard at it and some school doesn't bother. People need to be background checked. Their references need to be checked. We need to know that other people's backgrounds have been checked and their references have been checked. That is a crucial element. Whether or not we're asking people to show up with a certificate at a coaching event is another question. But when we sit down as a group of heads of school or a group of athletic directors and say these are the expectations, we've at least made it very clear what the understanding is and the circumstances under which someone would not be allowed to participate anymore and not be allowed to engage in you back with us because they don't have the same sense of obligation or the same systems to meet those obligations. And finally, making sure that we're talking about it candidly, okay? Again, if it is not being talked about, if it cannot be talked about, it will not be talked about. And so it's really important to be able to say, guys, we're going to be taking a group of 20 of you to blah, blah, blah. Look, stick together. I don't want you tearing off or going off. Make sure you're safe, blah, blah. Make sure it's clear what you're doing and why. The child protection standards are things that can and should be shared with children and not mysterious, and they're not things that we sort of one-sidedly need to hold to. They can know why we're doing the things that we're doing. Okay? And indeed, there's going to be more than this. But at the end of the day, my purpose today is to pass it to you. Start to talk about it, start to think about it, decide how you build a culture that positively pulls each other up and guarantees the, the well-being of the children in our care. 
And as I said, it's not okay if three of us police check our staff and one does not. We've introduced exactly the elements that we try to avoid when that happens. So we want shared standards and we want shared practices and we want to be sure that we're talking about them and holding each other to them, whatever those standards are. Okay? Some are easier than others, but we need to be able to talk about where those difficulties are and how we're going to overcome them. <clears throat> I looked at lots of different places. Even that image needed attribution. That's a good academic. I thought it was good to model the fact that we footnoted everything meticulous. You know, like that. Uh, there you go. That's <laughs> <straight away. laughs> okay. That's it, guys. Really, it's just to get the wheels turning a little bit. Thank you very much. Thanks for. Uh, for Sure, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone? Before I jump in again. <laughs> okay. Um, now, I want to talk to my colleagues for a minute. Yes. Um, where within an athletic environment is the most obvious place that any type of abuse, whether it's physical, emotional, or uh, sexual. sexual, where is the most obvious place it could take place but we wouldn't know about? It? Okay. Did everyone understand that? Maybe the lockers where they are, for example, changing, changing room. Yes. That's right. Or change room or whatever you want to touch. Exactly. Yeah. And that's and that's an interesting point because historically, I think many of you know the whole drive for more comprehensive child protection goes back in international schools about six years, perhaps thereabouts. Um, even though there have been school systems in places that have done it much longer, but this kind of global embracing of it. And until recently, the wisdom was that adults should not be in a child's bathroom. And yet, at the same time, it may remove the threat of adult abuse, and it introduces, in a huge way, peer abuse. And so, you need to, that, that's a deeply important balance to strike. I would say, it would be really hard to be alone with a child in a locker room, but, having, but being in there with the children does not have the same stigma. Being in there with peers and or the children does not. Having an assistant or an associate there, it can change the dynamic and allow you to fulfill your duties. Just being, just thinking about it and deciding as how you're gonna manage that. You're right, the locker room is fraught with peril. It's, it is the absolute hardest place to get a finger on. So yeah. we're talking about the, um, also in connection to accountability for as coaches, you can you keep us ADs accountable that we do all the paperwork for your athletes. So we send out a permission form to parents, medical forms, and Mark will talk a bit more about the pre participation form we done during the future. If that's not done and something happens, that's also a very big issue. So you've got to keep your ADs, people around you accountable to get that done, to talk to the parents, talk to before they practice, before they play. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you want to rush into a season, sometimes it's better to take a week. Not play, get the paper done, get the paper done, and get it started. Yes. And many of you know as coaches, of course, you know, oftentimes the ability of a child to continue in their participation depends on academic success or things like that. A coach's relationship with the child's teachers is crucial. It also reveals other elements that the potential for abuse, what the relationships are like outside. As we know, a child who doesn't feel safe doesn't perform in whatever domain they're in. And knowing the way it can translate either from the field to the classroom or the classroom to the field is important. So being able to have those discussions with the child's homeroom teachers, advisory teachers, people who are, are tasked with their welfare in the classroom or on the field is really important. And that's just about seeing it as a kind of, again, a shared responsibility. We're, we're building a net where a there should be no gaps. And that's where educational-based athletics comes into play. Because yeah. it should all, um, <clears throat> the umbrella should always be the educational environment. Yeah. 
That's absolutely right. There's a reason that we call these CCAs and not ECAs, not extra at all. They align very closely with other educational objectives and they should be working in total lockstep with them. And handing a child off from one class and teacher to another should be very much like handing them off to a coach or from a coach back to a teacher. Any other questions, guys? No. I think you can go. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks.